How great, how great, how great is our God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, worship team. I appreciate that so much. I think uh, you've got just about the right combination, Sister Nancy, honey. That's, that was sounding great. Can we give all of our musicians, our singers, a hand? Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. That's, as I touched on just a moment ago, there are things happening in the government that's so fast it's difficult to keep up. And uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, before I get into message, and today's message is not a romping, stomping, preaching type message. And uh, my style is to preach from my toenails up. Everything I've got, I put into it. But this morning we're going to slow things down and just actually just talk just a few moments. And, and I want to talk to the men. But before we get into that, I've got to tell you some things that's happening. The United States of America has taken tremendous steps backwards. This week we have in the United States the very first time in history we now have a position called the Minister of Equal Gender Equality. Right. Mm. A minister, get the title, a minister of gender equality. Now, as the name would indicate that they are trying to give everybody equal rights, well, it's not. It's designed to give the women, <coughs> lesbians and transgenders and bisexuals, all the rights that they can come up with. If you're interviewing someone for a job and a lesbian interviews for a job and you don't hire her, then she can file a complaint with our Minister of Gender Equality. And you may win the case, but you're going to spend many thousands of dollars on attorney fees to try to... The whole entire world is turning bad. In the Bible, this is very easily classified as we're taking the things that are wrong and making them right. We're taking the bitter and saying it is sweet. And again, this week, and let me ask you something. Uh, now, I, I, you know, I'm not going to try to point out any fingers here or anything, but sometimes you just do something and you think, God, how stupid was that? Now, Robert, I know you never have days like this. <laughs> but every now and then you do something like you take an egg out and start to break it and forget to put it in the pan. I mean, you know. You push the coffee button and don't put the pot under it. I mean, you know, how stupid do you feel sometimes? Or just feel sorry for those idiots that voted for Biden. Because you know they got to feel pretty bad right now. Actually, have a gas pump. Come on, folks. This week, he signed an executive order, ALL, -L. ALL. -L. All schools in the United States is to recognize the lesbian gay agenda. It is an executive order that all schools in America is going to teach this in our classrooms. Folks, let me tell you something. If God does not come back soon, He's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. But He's coming. But He's coming. He's coming. I had one person just last week or so said, I know for a fact that lesbians and gays are in heaven. And I said, number one, if you'll prove that to me, then I'll throw the Bible away. Now listen to me this morning. If there are lesbians and gays in heaven, this is worthless. Then God is a liar and two-faced. Now, come on. Come on. Come on. Why do you say that? Because he destroyed two entire cities. The cows, the mules. He destroyed two cities 
because of their actions. And then a couple verses below it, he says, and let this stand as an example to all the nations that follow. Now the good thing and the bad thing, honey, it's a sin, but sins can be forgiven. Amen? And I'm waiting on the day that we have a minister of child rapist. I'm waiting on the day we have a minister of pornography. You know? The transgenders say, you've got to accept us if they're pushing this on us. Listen, transgender, you couldn't even accept yourself. You can't accept yourself. Why do I have to accept you? Honey, let me tell you something. We will never accept sin as a standard in the church where I'm pastoring. Sin is sin, but the good thing about it is sin can be covered by the blood. But the woman at the well was shacking up Right? I mean, right? And he didn't say, go on and do whatever you want to do. Live with how many you want to. He said, I won't condemn you. That means I will not send your soul to hell. He said, I won't condemn you, but you need to go and sin no more. If you will change your ways, whatever your ways is in sin, God will forgive you. But it will take, as it says in Corinthians, you becoming a new person. Is that stealing candy off of a dollar store shelf? No. Is it stealing eight dollar a gallon gas? No. Whatever sin that you're doing, you're going to have to stop it and sin no more before you expect to make heaven your home. Amen? Amen. So everything is going crazy in the world. We know that. But I tell you, folks, we're not planning on being in the world that much longer. I mean, if you do not see that, you, you need to seriously sit down and do a little study. Everything is turning to the way that we are not going to be here that much longer. Thank you for being here this morning. We had 20-something people who have showed up for the men's breakfast yesterday. Mm-hmm. We had a great time. Uh, I tried my best to get Ron not to eat all the bacon. We had five pounds of bacon, but uh, that was a total futile attempt. But uh, we had a great time. Uh, I hope everybody got fed. Can we give a Diane and Debbie's one put all that together? Can we give the ladies... food was good. We had a great time. We had a good turnout. We had visitors and we thank you so much for bringing your friends. Uh, But this morning I want to get into the kind of the message and again I'm not going to romp and stone for preach this morning. I just want to talk to you. I want to give you a few scriptures and then I want to tell you a Bible story. Uh, I feel like a children's church pastor. I would like to have you know, a stage big enough. I can have all the dads come up and sit around on the steps like we used to do a little children's church. And you know, So this morning I just want to tell you a little Bible story. But any male can make a baby. But it takes a real man to be a dad. Amen. And dads, we have got some great dads here. Amen. 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 We have got some wonderful men of God that is leading their children. We got four generations here this morning. Folks, anybody can go out in the world and make a baby, but it takes a man to stand up and be a dad. It is the tough job. We celebrated Mother's Day just last month. Y'all remember that, don't you? Uh, there's a story of a teacher standing in front of a classroom and she says, tell me about Father's Day. And a little boy jumped up and he said, well, it's just like Mother's Day except you don't have to spend as much on flowers. (laughs) (laughs) Pretty much sums it up right there. (laughs) 
pretty much sums it up. So we always get ties, but we don't wear ties hardly anymore. We used to get the little packages of handkerchiefs. And by the way, I am running low on those. But uh, we used to get the package of handkerchiefs, and now that's gone away with. Then we get the little tool chest thing that we don't ever use, you know. But So I decided this year that we would give you breakfast and get you a hat, okay? So uh, well, I hope you enjoy that. But there's something about a man's tools. Now, something about coming of age, getting your own toolbox, my, our oldest son has my dad's toolbox, and let me tell you, he was as far from a fix-it man as you can get. Uh, I inherited that trait very well, but he was not a fix-it man, but he still had to have that toolbox. Oh, yeah. And I, I remember back when I got my toolbox, I felt like I'd actually become a man. It was Valentine's Day this year. <laughs> 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 I brought in a couple of weeks later and showed you and even preached a message off of the toolbox. I really felt like I'd become a man. This year I got my own toolbox. But there's something about a man's tool, power, the drive. If you've got a power tool in your hand, you feel like you can do something if it's right or not. You know, we're, we can do something with it, okay? But today, message, we're going to talk about dad's toolbox, okay? And I promise you I won't get you out of here any earlier than two. Um, but the man thing is essential in the home. A child that's raised without a dad is missing something more than just the obvious. A child that is raised without a mother in the home is missing something more than just the obvious. See, God created man, and contrary to the world standards nowadays, he reached into the rib of the man and pulled out a rib because in God's word, it's not good for a man to be alone. So he created someone, now pay attention, this is very misquoted, he created someone called Eve, not Steve. <laughs> so he took it to the rib and took away from him. Notice, men, that he didn't take the bone from the foot to symbolize that you can walk on your wife. He didn't take the bone from your fist symbolizing that you could hit on your wife. But he took the bone from the side to say that you are to walk side by side and be a team. I love what Dick said yesterday at the men's meeting is that a wife completes the man. But the man completes the wife. It makes a team. You've got to work together in all things. And I appreciate that so much. A man has got a task before him and and I don't know about all you guys, but my wife comes up with these crazy lists <laughs> of things that needs to be done. Can you, does anybody, anybody understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. You're getting the hang of it, all right? She comes up with this list and says, I need you to take care of this. And I'd say, okay, I'm going to take care of this. Now, now let me tell you something, ladies. Now pay attention here. This is to the ladies. When the man says, I'm going to do that, then he's going to do it. You don't have to keep reminding him. Month after month after month. Someone said years. So he'll get around to it, okay? But besides getting around to it, you got to put your mind to it and the mood. But you can't go out and hang sheetrock if you're in a carpet mood. Right? 
I got 17 amens there. The mood has to be with it. And folks, let me tell you something. You've got to have the mood. You've got to have the knowledge. You've got to have the get up and go. You've got to have the drive to get things done. If you'll stand with me, we'll read the scripture verse this morning. We're taking it out of 1 Timothy, the third chapter. Everybody ready? Okay. Everybody else will catch up. Everybody ready? Amen. First Timothy, the third chapter, we're going to read verses 1 through 4. This is a true saying, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, diligent, sober, good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not giving to wine, can't be beaten on your wife. Not greedy, a filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his house, having his children in subject with all the laws of God. I know some of you are stretching your head this morning. Say, why in the world is the pastor talking to me on Father's Day about being a bishop? That's his job. Well, that is true. That is my job. But folks, let me tell you something. If you're the man, you're the head of the house, the screen will catch up after a while. If you're the head of the house, you are the bishop of that estate. That's not a state given right. That's not an executive order. That is the Word of God. Amen. You are the bishop of that estate. Gracious Father, we ask your blessing on the message this morning. Lord, we thank you for fathers. We thank you for the office of bishop. We thank you for the office of fatherhood. God, that you ordained and instituted in the home. We pray you bless our pastor. Anoint him. Help us to receive his word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Now, I'm not going to ever say that men, we don't need help. All the women would say amen. We constantly need help. And let me tell you for a 100% fact, I could not do everything that I get done without the help of my wife. Somebody needs to say amen. She pays all the bills. She keeps up with all of our information to file our taxes, and we're going to get around to that whenever the mood strikes her. She makes sure everything is taken care of at the parsonage as well as our house. And then she comes to the church and enters all the data on a weekly basis, all the church records. She files her state report, her international report, and then she keeps up with the annual giving for every one of you on a weekly basis. There's no way in the world any one person could do everything that needs to be done. We are a church, we are a community, and it takes all of us to get things that's done and reach out and see more souls say we have got to work together. But before we buy something, in most situations, my wife and I will sit down and talk about it. Is this something that we need to do? Is it something we don't need to do? Now I have learned a tremendous amount over the years. If we make it, we're only about 14 more days, 13 more days now, away from being married 50 years. Now, we got a pretty good shot of making that, I think, I hope. I wish, I wish, I wish my sister was still alive. We've had a running joke for 30 years. When we were married 20 years, we were sitting in my sister's house, and I said, Sis, I get so tired of Diane being mean to me. She knows how mean Diane is, too. <laughs> And I said, I get so tired of her being mean to me. And I'm thinking about trading her off. And my sister, I like to fell out of the chair. She said, Lonnie, that's what you ought to do. You just need to go on and get rid of her. But now before you do, let's give her one 
more chance. So Esther has set a deadline right here. She's got 30 years <laughs> to quit being mean to you. And if that don't happen, then she's out of here. <laughs> well, those 30 years will be up next Saturday or Saturday after next. <laughs> and I wished my sister would be here to see that. But let me tell you something. We work together as a team. And everything that goes on, she typically will say, Lonnie, what we need to do with this. Ron is learning how to do that. He says, Debbie, what do we need? No, I'm sorry. He's, he says, Pastor, what do we need to do about that? Folks, let me tell you, it takes a team. Two is better than one. And if we work together for the same common cause, we'll get to our goals a whole lot quicker. Respect is not just given. Respect is earned. And the more that you treat your wife, the better you treat your wife, the more respect you will have, the more you will get accomplished. Amen? It's very, very simple that we have got to earn the respect of our families before we can reach anybody outside. Do you, I mean, you understand that? You can't just walk out and touch other people's heart and lives unless your house is in order. Let me go on and say this. I'm just going to get this out of the way. If a man or a male beats on his wife, you are not a man. You're a low-life scum that you are sick and need forgiveness. God puts you together as a team. He puts you together to love and respect each other. And when you can no longer do that, honey, let me tell you, there's sin in your camp. And we have got to understand that we, a true man, a true woman of God, loves their spouse. I would not know what to do. I would not know where to turn. I, honest to goodness, do not know if I could make it a week without my wife. We depend on each other so much that it would be difficult. I would be putting the eggs in the coffee maker. <laughs> Pretty much for sure. Genesis 2, 21 and the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And God took one of Adam's ribs to make a woman. He made a woman to walk beside the man and be a part and be a team as they could come together and complete one of other. And today, we're going to talk about God's toolbox that he has placed inside men. In this toolbox, there's a builder's square. Now, I want to tell you something. A few of you not including me, a few of you that knows how to use a builder's square. Okay, just because you got the tool doesn't sign you know how to use it. Oh, amen? Amen. 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 Okay. Or if men, you don't have to say amen, you can just grunt. <laughs> <laughs> The most important thing that a man needs to build is a relationship with God. You don't need a builder's square for that, but you need to get your relationship right with God before you can start being the head of the house to direct yours that what God has given you authority over. Your relationship is the most important thing. How about a measuring tape? Every time I go to this discount tool store over here, I end up buying three or four of those, or five or six of those little box cutter things because you never can find one when you need one. I've got probably 30 or 40 of them, but they're always in the wrong place. So I'll buy a few box cutters and I'll buy a measuring tape. When Justin was over here working on the kitchen, I don't have any measuring tapes. Between the kitchen, the carport, 
I bet we lost 20 measuring tapes. We'd go outside and start to measure. Well, where, where's the tape? Well, we couldn't find it. So we, we, I've started buying measuring tapes. But let me tell you what you need to measure with the measuring tape. The very first thing is how do you men measure up to the Word of God? Don't be concerned about your neighbor down the street. He's got a fancier truck. He's got a fancier toolbox. He's got more of this. He's got more power tools. Honey, don't judge yourself against Him. Judge yourself against what the Word says. See, what, his, what He has gone through that God has blessed Him with, you may never want to go through. Don't compare yourself with other men. Compare yourself with what the Word says. The second thing that you need to do once you get start measuring up to the Word of God is you need to measure yourself and see how you have grown as a Christian soldier. See, the Word says that when you are a little, you'll be as a baby and you'll drink the milk. But as you learn more in the Word, as you become more of a man, then you're going to leave the milk and turn to the meat. But I'm going to say this in all love and honesty. There are plenty of men that's 30, 40, 50, 60, and some never, ever becomes men of Christian value. They stay babies. They stay on the mill. Well, why is that, Pastor? Because it takes some work to do. It takes some discipline. It takes some actual things that you have got to want to do. God will not ever force anything on you. God will not force you to be a tremendous, mighty soldier. God will not force you to be a leader, you have to want to do it. The desire must be there. So the first thing that you need to do is square yourself with God and then measure yourself against the Word to see where I'm at and then how much have I grown. Now here's the scary thing. If you are at the same place spiritually that you was a year ago, Honey, something is terribly wrong. Thank you. Did y'all get that on film? He said, oh, by the way, we're using our new camera today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So let me tell you, if you are exactly the same place you was this time last year, something is wrong. Why is that? Because you are ordered by God to grow. Everything that God creates grows. Grass, dogs, cows, and Christians. If you're at the same place, you're not growing. If you're not getting stronger, you're not retaining more of the Word. You're not actually getting closer to God then are you on the right track? God's plan is for you to grow and get strong. Well, what do I got to do? Well, sometimes you've got to turn off the television and say, let's read the Bible. Sometimes you've got to quit playing on your cell phone and say, let's have a prayer. See, you are the man of your house. God has instilled you to be the spiritual leader. And I'm going to tell you without hesitation, God will hold you responsible for the spirituality of the people that cause your address home. Ouch. <clears throat> you are the bishop of your estate. Now, I can ask my wife to help me. I can ask anybody to do anything that I need to get done. But friends, if I drop the ball and it doesn't happen in my house, I'm telling you God 
is going to hold you, the man, responsible. You are the spiritual leader of your house. You will be held responsible. Folks, we need to understand what the Bible says and quit marking out the words and the verses that we don't like. Hello? You can never grow in God's grace by only reading the verses that you like in the Bible. It is called God's Word singular, not God's choice words. The whole thing has to go together. And the Bible does not dispute itself. It confirms itself over and over and over again. And it takes all of it for us to grow. Folks, you need to decide what's going to happen to the people in your house spiritually. If God comes back today or tomorrow, and by the way, folks, that won't surprise me. How many people in your house is going to make it? How many in your house that won't? You are responsible for your house. Men, we need to grow up and be men. We need to put on our big boy drawers and say, this is my house. And we're going to do it my way. And my way is God's way. Amen. When my boys was teenagers, they never was in any trouble. They was never in jail. They was never <laughs> locked up. We never had a police officer come to the house and say, I need to speak to one of your boys. They, as in all tendency goes, they was about as good as you could get. Now, I, I, I say that very, very openly. Folks, they was about as good as you can get. But good and lost is still lost. You understand that? Being good don't get you in heaven except in God's grace gets you there. And we had a rule in our house. We was old-fashioned. I said at 11 o'clock. That's when the doors lock. You need me on this side of it when I lock the doors. Amen. Now I know our youngest son quite well. And he drives just like his mother. <laughs> He's got two speeds wide open and stopped at the red line. And at five minutes to eleven, he would see how fast his little Mustang would run, I'm telling you. Because he wanted to be there for eleven. So I said, if you can't make it by 11, my phone needs to be ringing. Yes, sir. That's right. And at most every weekend, that phone would ring. Dad, I'm still about 10 minutes away. I'm okay. I'll be there. <laughs> so when he turned 18, he said, Dad, now that I'm an adult. <laughs> and I said, well, you sure are. Now I expect you to obey the rules a little bit better because it's still the same. My house, my rules. Amen. And if you want to be the bishop of your estate, back to you haul it up here. Amen. <laughs> but if you're living in my house, I'm the one that's responsible and it is my rules. And our youngest son got so mad and this really did one of those little sissy fits and Went out the door and slammed the door. I said, we'll be lucky if we ever get an invitation to his wedding. <laughs> Less than six months later, he says, Dad, can I come back home? I said, same rules. My house, my rules. He said, I promise. Honey, let me tell you something. You will never win your family by condoning their sinful habits. You have got to give them something to witness in your life that they won't in theirs. You can never 
allow them to do things that you wouldn't do yourself and ever try to win them. I'm going to say this. There's 159 verses in the Bible that talks about men. You're the head of the house. You're the spiritual leader. You are in charge of your estate. You are in charge of your home. You have got to set the rules and make sure they're enforced. You are in charge. Johnny Sue told me something one time. and Johnny said, honey, I think it's just about the solid, most solid truth I think I've ever heard. She said, a daughter is a daughter all her life. But a son is a son until he takes a wife. That is so true. Well, it's pretty close to what the Bible says. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall become as one flesh. Your responsibilities change, guys, when you become married. You became the bishop of your state. When man meets woman, I don't know if you can see these little lines on the screen, but when man meets woman, they come together. If you will align your marriage, your finances, your business up with Matthew 6.33 and put God the center of everything you do, you pull out that measuring tape we talked about a few minutes ago and you'll find out that if you get closer to God, you'll be closer to each other. It's a mathematical fact. You cannot get to the one that created love without loving more. The closer you get to God, the more you'll be to each other. Now I could go on for hours and hours talk about hammers and strength. Hammer is the strength of the the, the uh, sign of strength. And I know most of y'all don't remember that little group called the Carpenters. Uh, back when I was able to sneak away from home, I could listen to kind of that kind of music and there's a group called the Carpenters, and Karen Carpenter had this most beautiful voice, and they sang a song. Y'all know what it was? If I, had a hammer, if I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning. Y'all remember that, do you? I'd hammer in the evening. All over this land. I'd hammer out a danger. I'd hammer out a warning. I'd hammer out love If I had a hammer, if I had a hammer, what would I do with him? Looks like I've been trying to put up some panel in there. Saws. You gotta have a saw in your spiritual toolbox. Because with this saw, you have got to sever your relationship with the world. You've got to cut out all the things that represents the world and the fleshly desires. God says, but retaining the good fruit that He has placed in you. So as He thinketh in His heart, so as He is. What do you think? What's your spiritual toolbox look like? Joshua 6 chapter I want to, I'm going to tell you this little story. You don't have to look it up. You can read it when you get home. But Josh was working around the church one day. His cell phone rung. Josh said, hello. And on the voice on the phone says, Hey, Josh, this is God. I need you to do something for me. I need to take your army over and destroy Jericho. They've locked yourself in. Sins abounds, and I need you to just destroy all of that. Every bit of it. Joshua says, but God, <laughs> those Jericho walls, I mean, they're big enough you can have chariot races on top of the wall. Those walls was designed not to come down, God. And God says, I understand that. 
But I'll give you the access codes <laughs> that will cause those rocks to tumble. But remember, you don't take any souvenirs. You don't take any trophies. You take nothing. Uh, well, yeah, uh, sure, uh, sure. I got it. I understand. So here they go to Jericho. And you know the story. They weren't even allowed to talk to each other. Nancy, they put the musicians out in front. So they do what they're supposed to do. And sure enough, the walls come tumbling down. Why did the walls come tumbling down? Because they did what God told them to do. When God said to do it. The way God said to do it. And men, here's the problem that we have with dads today. They know what they should do. They know what the Bible says to do. But they're so easily distracted because the kids wants to watch this one TV program instead of having prayer tonight. My wife said, we need to go to bed early tonight. I've got to get up in the morning. So let's just don't uh, have Bible reading tonight. And then tomorrow night. And then the next night. Folks, let me tell you something. If you want to see your family go to heaven, if you want to see a spiritual revival in your family, you need to do it the way God says to do it, when He says, and how He says. Pastor, what's this got to do with Father's Day message? I'm glad you ask. I'm glad you ask. Because do you know that wasn't the last battle that Joshua fought, Right? So after Jericho, he went to find a few more battles and he lost them. What? Yeah. After Jericho, he wasn't winning these battles. So, wait a minute, God. What did I do for you? I went to Jericho and followed your rules. I did everything you told me to do and now I'm losing men. My men are being killed. I'm losing battles. So what's up? God said, there is a cursed thing oh, yeah. in the midst of me. Wait, 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 wait. This is the Father's Day message. Yeah, some of your fathers are letting things come into your house that's not mm -hmm. of God. Well, that's hard, Pastor. No, it's not. It's either you stand for God or you're not. 100%. So what's going to be your choice? See, you're the head of the house. You're the one that's got to set the rules. This is the way it's going to be. Because every time you break one rule, guess what's going to happen tomorrow? You have to break another one, and then another one, and then another one. And here's the problem. That it's over in Joshua 7. It says, You, fathers, cannot stand the wiles of the devil by yourself. You cannot fight the demon's power by yourself. And until you get rid of the sin in your house, you're going to have a hard time because you won't have God's blessings. Have you ever met anybody that constantly has financial problems? Have you ever met people that just absolutely cannot get it together? No matter what it is, it, it, that, if there's a, 
million ways to get it right, they'll find the million and one. It's just not going to turn out right. You know why that is? Because God is not blessing the direction. He is not directing their steps. And why is He not? Because you have not been the spiritual leader in your house. Let me tell you something. A church that does not stand for the Word of God is not a church. It's a social club. Amen. Come on. A church that does not stand for God is not a church. It's just a meeting place for sinners to come. What we need to do is a place for sinners to come but leave differently than what they came. And you're not going to have that if, unless we have the fire of God. Amen. And we cannot have the power of God until we clean up our houses. Fathers, there's penalties. There's penalties for not serving God. Do you know it's just as much wrong to go out and do something that you know is wrong but it's the same sin if you don't do what you know is right. Yes. Yes. Amen? Amen. It's, it's a sin to do something wrong, but it's also a sin to not do what you know is right. Folks, we need to get back and clean up our own little camps. There's a reward for doing right, but there's penalties for doing wrong. Men, you are the spiritual leader of your house. Are they sin in your camp? Are they sin in your life? Are you directing that house that would be godly or ungodly? If Jesus come to spend a week with you, what would you have to change? If Jesus come to spend a night with you, who would you be ashamed? Folks, men, you need to be the spiritual leader of your house. You need to be the bishop of your estate. If you want God to bless you, direct you, if you want your family saved, there's got to be some rules. There's got to be some things that's godly happening in your house. This hasn't been a preaching message but folks, I want just to have a talk with you this morning and let you know that your house makes up our church community. Amen. And what we have got to have is godly men and godly women making godly homes out there make a godly church in here. Amen. It takes all of us. We're after 12 o'clock, but I'm going to ask you to find somewhere to pray. Let's just take a few minutes and pray.